Welcome, um, everyone. Thanks for coming. I am Beth, Beth Michelet, and I'm the wine lady here. Got the dorky shirt on and everything. Um, <laughs> I have, I started making wine probably about 30 years ago. It makes me kind of old, but regardless. Um, I set it aside for a while, picked it back up, ended up working here, started teaching classes here, got the education thing going, and it's really been a lot of fun. And what I'm hoping to send home with all of you today is the knowledge to make wine to your taste that turns out really good. Because as I always tell every customer, and some of you have been my students before, will have heard it, um, but uh, you can make wine from, you know, you follow any recipe, you'll end up with wine. But if you want a good wine or a wine that suits your tastes, if you learn to test a few things, They'll end up with a really good, good batch of wine that you like. Because at the end, the end of the day, that's what you want is wine that you like, not what somebody else tells you you should like. Okay? Some people like it sweet, some people like it dry, some people like it really fruity. And um, what grapes have naturally, most wines, of course, are made from grapes. We've got all our wine kits and juices and whatnot. Um, but grapes very naturally have enough sugars, they've got the right amount of acidity, and tannin, and all those complexities. Other fruits can make a lovely wine, and I think they take kind of a bad rap because a lot of people make lousy wine out of fruit. We've probably all tasted some that really aren't very good, but um, that's what we're gonna learn to not do today. Today we're gonna make good wine, okay? So, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do two kinds, I'm gonna do two separate batches, I'm gonna do, a strawberry, first I'm going to do a rhubarb wine, and then I'm going to do a separate batch of a strawberry wine. I do have samples at the end of both some homemade strawberry and rhubarb, and I have got a carafe, and we're going to even blend some of them so we can taste a blended strawberry rhubarb, okay? And it's, this is interactive, ask questions all along the way, I will just fire away at me and I'll do what I can, okay? So the first thing we always do, this is a bucket of water with sanitizer. Oh, for, before we get started, has anyone, who has not made wine? Okay, so there's some people that haven't made wine at all, so we're going to go through the steps. You know, maybe the bottling and stuff, just a little bit. But, so, so when you're making wine, you do want to um, make sure everything's clean. So I've got a big bucket of a sanitizer water right here, and it's just water. In this case, actually, it's one step, which is a high quality cleanser that we sell here, but you can get it any place. It's an oxygen-based cleanser, so it's a no-rinse. That's kind of good enough on the front end. We'll be fine with that. So that's what's in there, and I've got a lot of bits of stuff going. I already sanitized this bucket once, but um, I'll do that again. To me, the biggest thing when you're making uh, fruit lines is to, it's called balancing the juice. You want to get your um, sugars, pH, and acidity right. You want to pick the right yeast for it to end up with the kind of wine that you like. And, and as I go through, these recipes are my recipes. That does not mean you aren't going to find a thousand others out there. There certainly are, and they might be just equally as good. But this is what I found going through my so far. And they keep changing. Every time I write them up, I change them a little bit. So we might change them during class today. Wouldn't be surprised. Okay. So, uh, and did everybody get paperwork? I've got three different books here that are good fruit wine books. Mary's recipes. That's put up by um, Purple Foot Wine Club in Milwaukee. This is Terry Gary, who's pretty humorous to read. And this little purple book comes with the one gallon fruit wine starter kit, which probably a lot of people already have. If you don't, we package up a lot of these additives, bucket, primary fermenter and stuff. Um, actually, if anybody wants to look at those, you can grab them and pass them around. Uh, also, um, hopefully you've got recipes, a uh, couple of recipes. I've got a, a yeast chart, just one. There are a number of others. And uh, that helps, helps give you some guidance on maybe what kind of yeast you want, want to use because you could do the exact same batch of wine three times with three different yeasts and end up with three different tasting wines. So it does make a difference, okay? 
and one of the guys here, Dale, just put together this um, pick your own uh, sheet that has a lot of pick your own tech places within an hour of the, of the store here. So that should be pretty helpful. Okay, on with class. What I do to start rhubarb wine, rhubarb is pretty, pretty durable stuff. You got these big hard chunks of stalks. So what I do, what I did with this, for starters, I take it and um, wash it, chop it up, freeze it, and this is thawing now. I just pulled this out of the freezer this morning. Um, when you freeze your fruit, I freeze most fruits before I make wine out of it. It breaks down the cell wall and helps to extract the juice a little better. Okay, That's the reason for doing it. You will find other recipes that talk about pouring boiling water over or actually cooking it up. That's okay. Sometimes it sets up the pectins a little bit more so you might have more trouble clearing your wine. So that's kind of the reason for freezing and thawing it. You're not going through that whole cooking process. So. That's just dumped in right now. What I do along with that is put some sugar right on top of it. This this is going. To, this is a three-day elapsed time. Can you all see in the mirror the difference? This has been sitting on sugar, pectic enzyme, and uh, a little candon for three days, and it pulls out that much juice. I'm kind of taking a stab at it here. I'm going to put in four cups of sugar. And um, the pec what pectic enzyme does is it helps um, break down the pectins in the wine to clear out the juice, to clear out the wine a little bit better. Oh, I've got to find my measuring spoon. <laughs> this is like whole fish. There. Okay. Um, so usually a half a teaspoon of pectic enzyme per gallon is fine. Um, and, and I will do that today. Oops, so wet. Okay. Where did we get that? Where is it? There it is, right here. Let me pull it out. Okay, so we're just putting in some pectic enzyme. And the reason to put in a Camden tablet, okay, Camden tablet, metabisulfite, there is both potassium and sodium metabisulfite. The potassium is the one I always use in my wine baking because it dissipates out better. It does not leave residual sodium flavors in the wine. So, um, so the deal with Camden is it is um, a pre-measured dose of a powder. And what it does is it kills off wild yeast and bacteria. So because this was a uh, fresh chopped up rhubarb, there's going to be plenty of bacteria in it. There's certain things I don't bother to do that with. Um, a spoon, like, there it is. <laughs> See one? Oh, here it is over here. Sure. They can. Okay. So. Um, there was a little town in England called Camden, England, and that is somebody there came up with the idea of this pre-measured dose. One tablet per gallon. So all I do is just stir it up here. I just let this sit loose with a bag loosely over it for about three days. And then I call that, it's weeping. So I've gotten this much juice out of it in just a few days time. Rhubarb has oxalic acid in it, and if you leave a whole lot of the pulp on it for too long, it can get kind of a strong bitter taste. So what I do at this point, personally, is I'll, I'll squeeze off about half of that pulp. And by doing that, I'm leaving some rhubarb flavor. I've got all the juices, I've got some rhubarb flavor, and I've got um, not so much that I have to, um, that it kind of loses it gets its bitterness from the oxalic. You said you cover it. You cover it with plastic. Or you know what? I just had a, I just had a loose plastic bag like from Target sitting over the top. Of it. That's all I did. You could you could put a lid on. He was asking me if what I covered it with, and it doesn't really matter because it's not fermenting at that point. So you could put a tight lid on it. Sometimes I'll put it in a cold place. I did not this time. This time I left it on the counter. But sometimes I'll put it in the refrigerator if the garage is colder. I'll put it out there. Seem to be fine just leaving it on the counter for a few days. Okay. Let's 
someplace down here. I have a strainer. There we go. Okay. So all I'm going to do here is take, um, just scoop out some of this pulp. Just get a little of it out of here. And I, in this case, I don't bother on the rhubarb wine with a, with a straining bag just because I'm doing this. Now there's plenty of other recipes that just talk about um, instead of doing all this, they instead add um, calcium carbonate. And they add that right at the beginning. That also controls the oxalic acid somewhat. I just tend to be a little less of a powder person than some people. If, if I don't need a powder, I don't put it in. So, it's, so I'm just trying to get as much juice out of here as I can. Um, you, could, you could break this down. Like if you wanted to at home, you could break this down a little bit each day. You could stick your hand in there and break it up. Because they actually break up fairly, oops, I'm lose. <laughs> they, they break up fairly readily um, once it's been sitting. Okay, I'm going to throw this in the garbage. Just get rid of it. Okay, so now we have fruit ready to um, ready to turn into wine. So the next thing I'll do is add water. And with any fruit wine, what I usually do is I, if you're doing one gallon, you try to just come up with enough water to equal a gallon. That's all. So, oops. In this case, I am using spring water. I was. Some people, you can use whatever kind of water you want. I happen to like spring water. I don't usually buy it. I usually go down to the artesian well, but here at the store, sometimes we just buy a little bit of water. The main thing that I'm trying to avoid is um, chlorine, fluoride, water softeners, that sort of thing. If you have uh, reverse osmosis, that's fine. I guess, I figure at the point I'm gonna make wine, if it's, if it's not something I just really wanna drink, I mean, I probably don't want to put it in my wine. It's not going through a boil or anything like that. So whatever you put in there stays in. Okay. So this is just a stab. I probably put in six pints of water. I don't even know what my recipe says, but this is kind of the way I tend to build wines. Yeah. You have on your recipe three pounds of rhubarb. Is that before you freeze it or after? Does it weigh more or less? No, it should weigh the same either should way. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And you'll be able to taste what it tastes like with the three pounds of rhubarb. I've got a batch of that here. Um, and yeah, you just, yeah, it should weigh the same before and after. I just go beforehand, whatever. Uh, okay, so I had all this sugar that I put on here. So there's a fair amount of sugar in this already. So I'm not gonna just start dumping sugar in here. The first thing I'm gonna do is incorporate that a little bit Stir it up. Um, a lot of recipes also call for a cup of white grape concentrate. That is another way to kind of smooth out the flavors. You can use something like this. You can even buy a can of like the frozen white Welch's. That's a Niagara grape. Something like that works as well. Um, I didn't use it on my last one. I kind of like that fresh rhubarb taste, so I'm going to leave it alone. But a lot of my fruit wines, I do add a little bit of. Um, concentrate to smooth it out, give it a little bit more traditional flavor. Okay, so the next thing we, we want to do here is um, work on the specific gravity. Specific gravity is, um, it's reading the amount of fermentable sugars that you have in your, in your batch of wine. Whoops, it's a psycho fish. So what I'm using here is a 99 cent turkey baster, a testing jar, and a hydrometer. So this is what a hydrometer looks like. I'll pass one around for you guys. So if you have not seen it, you'll know what I'm talking about. Okay. Okay, so here is one. So basically, a hydrometer, if it's sitting here, it floats in plain water at 1.000. As you add sugar, it floats higher and higher, like this. So you get to pick and choose how much sugar you want, how high you want your alcohol to be. Uh, on a lot of the fruit wines, I don't make the alcohol as high as I would on maybe a full-bodied red wine. A full-bodied red wine can handle that 13 or 14 percent. A lot of times a fruit wine gets too, 
to me it gets too much of an ethanol -y, alcohol -y taste, so I'll drop it back a lot of times to about 11 and a half percent, and that seems to be better. Sometimes even lower, like 10 and a half is okay. Um, so this is a triple scale hydrometer. It's got specific gravity, it has potential alcohol, and it has bricks. So the specific gravity is the reading that we're going to do, and I always encourage you to start with the specific gravity reading, whatever wine you're making, whatever recipe you're following. If you take a reading, you will know right before you start how much uh, what your, how much alcohol your wine will have. You can you can work this out from the very get go. Okay, it really helps. You take your beginning reading, which will be today, and then you take your ending reading in um, a month and you subtract it out, and that gives you, it's pretty close, it's not an exact measurement, but it's pretty close. So I'll pass it around. Some people may not have seen a hydrometer. It's a really helpful tool. I mean, there are not a lot of things that you have to have in winemaking, though I will say, like, even with your primary fermenters, if you're wanting to use stuff at home, if you want to use your own equipment, make sure, also some people don't use like an old pickle bucket. You do want to use food grade plastic, but if it's something that's had like bleach or pickles or something, your wine is going to take on some of that taste. So that's, you don't want to do that. Now, what I've done, and I've discovered this in the past too, I, I put in quite a bit of sugar on the front end, but I lose some of that as it sits here. I just threw some of the garbage can, okay? So right now, this is at, um, oh, it's only at about 1.0, Three zero uh, zero five zero right now. So what I'm going to do is add sugar. I want to get this up to about one point zero nine zero. What did I write in my paper? One point zero. Did I? Okay, that was good. I like that. <laughs> but that's personal. If you want more alcohol, you can get more alcohol. So I'm going to put in. Uh, go. And the thing I do, you don't just dump it in, because if you just dump it in, you can't take it back out. So if you kind of add it gradually, and I just added two cups, which is a little gutsy on my part, but um, I'm gonna hope that makes it about right. Okay. And then what we'll do after this is we'll uh, do a couple quick tests on pH and acidity. 